Welcome all. It is 10 a.m. here in Chicago, and so we will get started with this conversation with Chip Conley, Learning to Love Midlife. And he is going to be sharing in a moment 12 reasons why life gets better with age. Before we jump in, though, I'd love to welcome you on behalf of the University of Chicago. I'm Seth Green. I'm the Dean of the Graham School and the decanal sponsor of the Leadership and Society Initiative. For those who are not familiar, LSI is an effort at the University of Chicago to support distinguished leaders in designing meaningful encore chapters of leadership for society. And we do that with a year long program here at the university for fellows who want to reflect on and then design meaningful and ambitious next chapters. Chip Conley has been one of the key thought partners as we got started in this effort. And since then he has written what is going to be, if it's not already a best-selling book on learning to love midlife, which has been making extreme waves because it really provides insightful guidance on how to think about this stage of life. And so with that, let me take down my screen so that we can see not just me, but let me uh, add Chip here. Hello, Chip. And let me Great to see you, welcome you, Chip. Chip Conley is on a midlife mission after disrupting the hospitality industry twice, first as the founder of Joy de Vivre Hospitality, the second largest operator of boutique hotels in the US, and then as Airbnb's head of global hospitality and strategy, leading a worldwide revolution in travel. He then more recently co-founded the Modern Elder Academy in January 2018, and he's actually at their new place in Santa Fe, New Mexico right now. The goal is to really harness the power of intergenerational mentoring as a modern elder and to be part of the wellness journey. And we'll talk more about the MEA as one of the world's first midlife wisdom schools. Uh, he has been all over, and so you may have already seen him talking about this book on the Today Show, Good Morning America and Beyond. And we are thrilled to have you here with us virtually at the University of Chicago. And so I want to get started, Chip, by asking the question, what motivated you to write this book? Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here, Seth. And I congratulations on the very successful launch of LSI. We, you and I were talking about this be before it was a real thing. And I'm, I'm, it's just great to see the movement because I, I, I think that what we're doing sort of in a mass way uh, you're doing in a, a just such a beautifully quality, high quality way um, and in a deeper way um, with uh, your students. Um, so I, I, I love that we're on this journey together. So when I was at Airbnb, they called me the modern elder. I didn't like that a whole lot, <laughs> but I was 52 years old. Then old average... Essentially, that's what they were saying. Well, just well, that's, what I, that, that's how I took it. But then they said, the founders said to me, because I was, I was the in-house mentor to the founders, and then they said to me, this was a long time ago, this was 11 and a half years ago. Then they said, Chip, a modern elder is someone who's as curious as they are wise. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, if it, it, I like the alchemy of curiosity and wisdom. And so in my 50s, uh, while I was twice the age of the average person in the company, I really learned a lot about what midlife is about in the workplace. Yeah. Um, but then I actually started getting curious about it more broadly. Um, and uh, midlife as a as a as a life stage, um, and um, that's what led me to creating MEA, uh, the Modern Elder Academy, um, the world's first midlife wisdom school. And the real intent was to help people to reimagine and repurpose themselves. And part of the reason I wrote this book is because we've had five thousand, almost five thousand people from forty eight countries come to our Baja campus. Uh, we are opening the Santa Fe, New Mexico campus where I am right now. Uh, this spring. And, you know, I just felt like I've learned a lot about midlife in the last six years since we've opened. And I wanted to share that with more people. Well, I want to dig into your own midlife. But before we jump in to the experience, I want to just take a step back uh, because you've looked at this research, I have as well. As people are living longer, one of the things I love is a quote that it's not just extending old age 
but it's actually changing every chapter of life, meaning that with people reliably, if they make it to 60 and are healthy by a number of factors, knowing that they have a very high chance of going to 90, it doesn't just mean that you get 30 more years of retirement. It actually means that every stage of life is now different because the equations entirely changed. And so I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about this world of midlife and how it's changing, because I know that's the context in which you're seeing this issue and you're seeing you know, these 5,000 individuals coming to MEA. They're not coming because they're thinking, oh, I'm going to retire. They're coming because they're thinking there's a whole new chapter of life and I'm trying to think about how to play with it. That's right. Um, we call, so we've worked quite closely with academics from a variety of Ivy League schools, as well as West Coast schools like Stanford and UC Berkeley as well, to create a, a curriculum that is, which is, we call long life learning, not lifelong learning. Lifelong life, life learning is a big umbrella. We're just a, a, a narrow pillar under that umbrella where long life learning is, is about how to live a life that's as deep and meaningful as it is long. And it requires understanding the life stages. Um, right. And so there's been a lot of work on this done, you know, in, in the 20th century by Eric Erickson and a variety of other thinkers, uh, Gail, Gail Sheehy with her book, Passages, et cetera. But we wanted to modernize that because most of what's been written, uh, James Paulus, uh, James Hillman, a lot of what's been written by these folks was written at a time when the average longevity in the United States was in your 60s. Um, so uh, longevity in the U.S. was 47 in the year 1900 and grew to, two, uh, to 77 by the year 2000. So we added 30 years of life. And along the way in the 20th century, adolescence became a more uh, popularized notion. Uh, re re uh, retirement became a big deal. And also midlife became something because when you're living longer, you do have a midlife. And so Mary Catherine Bateson, the Harvard professor who recently passed away, talked about a midlife atrium. She said yeah. that what people need in, in their 50s is the idea, uh, 40s or 50s, but maybe even 60s, you need a space to reflect upon how do you want to consciously curate the second half of your adult life. Um, and so long story short is that's part of what we've tried to, to do is to create a space for people to understand their life stage, reframe their relationship with aging, because Becca Levy's work at Yale has shown that when people shift their mindset on aging from a negative to a positive, they gain seven and a half years of additional life. Wow. We re you know, Seth, one last thought. We hear so much these days about longevity and about people biohacking their future so that they're never going to die. That's getting a lot of attention these days. But what's so right. interesting is- not that Modern Elder Academy, to be clear. You're, you have no, a very different- most yeah, most of the attention is really on this physical side, the physical side of the science of longevity, when in fact the socio-emotional side, how you yeah. connect with others and how you feel about yourself has a more, so far, a more powerful impact on in, in increasing your longevity. So that's the focus that we have. Well, so before we jump into the methodology that you've developed and that really comes through brilliantly in this book, I want to talk about you, uh, Chip Conley, and your own midlife experience. And maybe you could just walk us through your navigating midlife, because I know that really shapes your lens on these topics. Yeah. So I was um, I went to Stanford undergrad and Stanford Business School, graduated um, at a very young age uh, and at 23 in the business school and a couple of years later started a boutique hotel company called, as you said, Joie de Vivre and ran that company for 24 years from age 26 to 50. And I loved it until about age 46. And my late forties was just a, a train wreck on many levels, not just professionally, but personally. And, and, and I think spiritually in all kinds of ways. I, and I lost five male friends to suicide during that time, during the great recession. Um, and they're all men um, age 42 to 52. So wow. I I got through, my, yeah, it was tough. It was a very tough period. Um, I had an NDE, I had a near-death experience where I had an allergic reaction to an antibiotic because of a broken ankle. And so <laughs> all of this conspired for me to say, say wow, midlife, midlife is, I'm gonna say it, midlife sucks. Um, All right. well, that's how I was thinking about <laughs> Yes. 
Well, the U curve of happiness, I had no I had never known anything about this because it hadn't been uh, really publicized yet. And so I, in in my 50s, I started to learn about the U curve of happiness and seeing like, okay, yeah, 45 to 50 is the low point. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And that's one of the things we really dive into uh, at MEA. But then my 50s were spectacular. I sold that company um, and, uh, you know, Hyatt, the, a Chicago-based company now owns uh, Joie de Vivre and, and it's called JDV. But um, I went into my 50s with a with sort of a beginner's mindset about how might I curate the rest of my life. And and then that was my best decade of my life. So I, hmm. I had this weird feeling, uh, Seth. I saw midlife as the tale of two midlifes. There was the bad yeah. period in my 40s, late 40s. And then there was the good period in my 50s. And I'm 63 now. So I've I have had enough time to reflect upon this and then do pretty detailed research on what is the midlife time period meant for. And I, and I would re really say at this point, the best way to define midlife is it's the bridge between early adulthood, which might end around 35, and later adulthood, which if we're living longer, might start around 75. So right. midlife could be a life stage that lasts 40 years. And that to me is one more reason why we need to study it and understand it well, because we have very little in the way of social infrastructure to support people during this period of life. Well, so as midlife gets longer, one common theme is that more people are reinventing themselves. They're trying on new hats, going in new directions because the breadth of time allows you to potentially start in a new way and then actually build up knowledge and expertise while still taking with you some of your past experience. You did that. You went from leading this boutique hotel company to you know, this group of 20-somethings that were starting up this thing called Airbnb. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that experience, what you took away about, you know, how to think about midlife from your own experience doing that, which I believe is the 50s uh, happiness <laughs> that you're describing uh, in your story? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we don't do a lot is to understand what have we developed in the way of mastery or a gift or wisdom. Um, we're pretty good at accumulating knowledge and most universities sort of specialize in that. Um, but to distill wisdom or metabolize your life experience to make sense of it, that what you've learned along the way is not something that we have developed as, an, as a society. Um, so I think for me, what I really looked at in my fifties was like, wow, I have some wisdom that I wouldn't have even called wisdom because it's sort of, yeah. to me, obvious in my 50s, whereas to younger people, it was like not obvious. It was like, oh, wow, that's that that's pretty interesting stuff. So I, I really learned at my during my 50s about intergenerational collaboration and how important it is. Um, by next year, the U.S. Department of Labor says that the majority of Americans will have a younger boss. We've never seen mm. this before. Um, and so how do we work across generations? How did I learn how to become what I called a mentor, a mentor and an intern at the same time. So as the mentor, I was wise. As the intern, I was curious. And I had to be curious at age 52 when I joined that company because I never worked in a tech company before. So that was another thing I had to learn is how to, how to um, have a curiosity and an openness to learning new things. Um, and, you know, I, I also had to right size my ego. I mean, uh, Richard Rohr, who's one of our faculty members at MEA and is teaching uh, in July at our Santa Fe campus. And he's also an alumni. He came to our Baja campus as a student, amazingly, when uh, Lynn Twist, who wrote The Soul of Money, was teaching. Um, he says that the primary operating system for the first half of our life is our ego. And it's, you know, it, it's what individuates us. And then for the second half of our life, it's our soul. But nobody hmm. actually gave us any instructions for this new operating system of the soul. And I had to learn that. I had to learn how to right-size my ego um, in the context of being both the mentor and the intern. Um, but I think more than anything, I, I really needed more than anything. I, I think I needed to see that, wow, in my mid fifties, I might only be halfway through my adult life. The average yeah. age of the person who comes to MEA is 54. Um, and 54 is exactly halfway between 18 and 90. And so yeah. if you think you're going to live till 90 and you're 54, you still have as much adulthood ahead of you as you have behind you. 
And when you start to think that way, it really shifts your mindset about how you're going to curate your life. Well, I just want to say one thing I find so fascinating about these stats and the context is that I find it very liberating. So I hadn't heard that exact stat uh, that next year, most people will be with a boss that's younger than them. But what I love about it is that it's liberating in the following sense. I think a lot of times you say, oh, I get to this point in my career. Well, the way that careers work is I only get higher. And so once you go up a certain level of altitude, suddenly it's actually very restraining because now there's very few things I can do because if I'm only going higher, there's only a little bit more in that peak, right? You start to say, oh, you know, within midlife, you can have multiple chapters. You can have multiple experiences, right? You start to realize, oh, there's a mountain over there. There's a mountain, I can climb these, I can get back to the base. I can do these different things, right? And indeed, it's very unlikely that I'm gonna go till 75 and be the boss of everyone, or I'm gonna be the top or, you know, so once you kind of come to that, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities. But I think the second part of what you said is so important just to affirm, which is this ego to soul. And David Brooks has talked about, you go from an extrinsic accountability to this intrinsic, but then you have to find this soul or this intrinsic that you necessarily haven't touched as much during that first stage of life when you're building your career and you're trying to climb the early parts of that mountain. So it requires a lot of retraining of your brain because it's different than the way that you've thought the entire time until you get to that point in the mountain. But let me turn it back to you for thoughts on that. Yeah, well, two, two thoughts. For, I'll go to the soul piece second. The first piece is um, Arthur Brooks' book, From Strength to Strength, which I'm sure yeah. many of the people on this call have read. Um, we He's on our uh, MEA online faculty, and he um, he wrote about MEA in the book. He, he He's talked a lot about, you know, the move from um, fluid intelligence to crystallized intelligence. Yeah. And I think if we, if we start to own that and start to realize that, wow, crystallite fluid intelligence is fast and focused, good problem solving, but tends to have no peripheral vision and young people, the younger brain is trained to be that way as a brain shrinks, as it gets older, sorry to say it does shrink a little bit. Um, we learn how to be more adept uh, to have four wheel drive of the brain. We go from left to right brain more adeptly. We can think holistically, systemically and connect the dots. So knowing that, how do you curate your career based upon right. that knowledge? And that's part of what we help with. Um, and, and I think it also speaks to this idea, uh, your second point, which is the soul is like, if one of the things I, I loved about my experience at Airbnb, seven and a half years, four years, full-time, three and a half years, part-time, um, was that it gave me the opportunity to not be competitive because I wasn't yeah. going to compete with the 25 year olds and the 30 year olds in the company. What I had is the opportunity to be a mentor. And I think there's really two roles of a mentor. You can either be the librarian, you have the know-how and the know-who and people ask you questions and you answer, or you can be the confidant, the person who gives your mentee confidence. Yeah, And that person is often leading with questions, almost like a coach and, and helping not to just uh, helping to dispense knowledge, but helping to develop wisdom in, and, and frankly, human qualities in, in that mentee. And so it's been, you know, I wrote a lot about this in my book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, um, which is my, based upon my experience at Airbnb. Well, so I want to jump into your advice, Chip, because this book is filled with great insight and recommendations. And so let's just start with what you see as the number one piece of advice that you would give for anyone going through a transition at this stage of midlife. Well, you know, we ha and, and we have really four pillars to the MEA program, navigating transitions, cultivating purpose, owning wisdom, and reframing aging. Um, so navigating transitions is, is close to my heart. Um, once you realize that there are three stages to a transition, the ending of something, the messy middle, and the beginning of something new, it helps a lot because you can try to understand which stage are you in. Um, I like to think of this as the caterpillar to butterfly journey. There's the uh -huh. caterpillar consuming and producing. Uh, there's the chrysalis where the transformation happens. Um, and then there's the but the butterfly that's going out and po pollinating in the world. Um, maybe if you're if you, if we look at it from the perspective of a modern elder, it's when you're pollinating your wisdom in the world. So 
once you know that those are the three stages, ending, messy middle, beginning, uh, and by the way, that's part of the reason I call midlife not a crisis, a chrysalis, because yeah. chrysalis is the mid stage for the butterfly. And yes, it can be dark and gooey and solitary, but it's also where the transformation happens. And based upon the U curve of happiness, we get happier, af happier after age 50. But I think the most important thing is to know there is there are different coping mechanisms depending upon which stage you're in. Yeah. If you're in the ending of something, you ritualize it. If you're in the middle of something, the messy middle, you you need social support and you need to find the through line. And if you're uh, in the third stage, the beginning of something new, you have to have a growth mindset um, and be willing to actually make mistakes because a growth mindset is focused more on improving yourself and learning, whereas a fixed mindset is more focused on improving yourself and winning. And if the, so that's a very short encapsulation, yeah. encapsulation of the the anatomy of a transition at the bottom of the mea website meawisdom.com you'll see that there's a free resource called the anatomy of a transition that goes into that in much more detail can we go a little bit deeper now uh i'd love to yeah. just talk about the action words you use to describe what you do at each of those stages so let's start sure. with that ending what do you mean by ritualize it i i have a imagination but I want to, you know, yeah. hear tangibly, uh, what would it look like for me to try to ritualize an ending? Let me, let me give you a story. So there's a woman yeah. in Mariana and she's based in the San Francisco Bay area, very well-known branding and graphic designer. And she was very good at her craft. So good that she ultimately built a built a company with 20 or 25 people in it. But yeah. she didn't love run, she didn't love running a company, um, uh, and especially in the ups and downs of the Bay Area economy, um, she found that she was she didn't enjoy being the CEO of that company. Long story short is um, she came to MEA and she said like I I don't know how to end this I don't know how to <laughs> shut down my business um, and so by the end of a week's workshop, she had come to this conclusion that like she needed to really ritualize it. She needed, she knew she wanted to end it. She's been working on it for five years, but she'd not done anything to say, okay, that's the past. Let's go to the future. And so she in, ultimately invited um, all, she told her staff and her clients that she was going to spend the next six months shrinking the business to just her and a, an associate and an executive assistant. Um, and so and then, so she invited all those folks, all of her past clients, all of her past employees, friends and family to a cemetery. And they had a party. They had a rocking party to celebrate the, 20, the 15 or 20 years she'd been in business, but also to recognize it gave everybody the opportunity to say something about why they love the company. But it helped her move on because rituals help you in a social context um, feel supported when you're going through a transition. So that's an example of a ritual. Yeah. Um, well, so coming into that the middle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I want to jump into that next stage. So the middle, you mentioned social support, that that's critical. And I can imagine, but um, just talk about why and what that looks like. Uh, because oftentimes after that ending, people lose a lot of their community because so much of that community is tied with work. So you know, how do you think about that and how do you get there in a moment where you need it more than ever, but it may be less available because transitions can be so hard on our social relationships in a world where work controls more of that universe than it used to by a lot of different measures. And Seth, you know, you know as well as I do, uh, that social wellness, the idea of investing in your relational capital is exceptionally yeah. important. Bob, Bob Waldinger's yeah. work at Harvard and his book at The Good Life last year showed that basically the people who were happiest and healthiest in their 80s and 90s, the number one Have variable was how invested were they in their social relationships in their 50s yeah. uh, uh, or in, and, and, and later. Um, so social the social piece of this is really important because frankly, when you're going through the messy middle, it's it, it can be an awkward time. You, you can feel like the, the ground is shifting under you. Bruce Feiler calls it a life quake. Um, and so it feels like there's tremors happening. And and to have someone, have a friend there or have a coach or have people in your life who can be the objective you know, and supportive folks is really important. Um, because often you start to get a jaundiced idea of yourself 
during that time. You feel maybe incompetent. Um, and then the other piece was the idea of a through line or a thread. And you know, if you remember that the, the story of the Thai soccer, the, the boys, uh, the soccer players who went into the caves uh, before a monsoon rain happened, and then they got caught in the back of a cave. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Ron Howard made the movie about it. The, the only way they could get those guys, the young uh, teenagers out, um, when the water had risen such that they were stuck in the back of a cave and they couldn't find their way through the maze, is uh, the divers, the scuba divers who went through had a rope. And the rope, they took all the way through this maze uh, in the water, all the way to the back of the cave where the boys were. And then they took the boys back that way. So the question is, what's the rope? What's the what's the through line yeah. that's going to make sense? Victor Frankl, quite famously in, in Man's Search for Meaning, talked about the fact that in the middle of a concentration camp, the people who actually were able to survive it were the ones who could see the future, had hope, and they could see the meaning in this terrible experience. And similarly, yeah. when you can see that your your um, your past you know life lessons uh, or your painful life lessons are the raw material for your future wisdom, you're more able to see like okay, where's this going to lead me? And and in that level of uh, of hope and confidence can can see you through that messy middle. Um, and then the last stage is the beginning. And, and I, you know, Carol Dweck's work at Stanford is a big part of our program. The idea, and it's really important as we get into midlife. Let me explain that for a moment. Yeah. Um, when we, if, if our mindset is like very much um, narrow and we only focus on the things we do well, as we get into midlife, our sandbox gets smaller and smaller. Um, yeah. And we're less curious, we're less interesting, we're bored. And so it's really important um, as we move into that third stage of the beginning stage to recognize that when we're going to try something new, we're not going to be very good at it. When the butterfly comes out of the chrysalis, generally it ends up on the ground first because its wings are wet and has never flown before. And it doesn't take long for it to actually get up and fly. But for us, whether it's learn for me, learning a lang new language at 57, I started learning Spanish because I was living in Mexico part time or learning how to surf at 57, I had to have a point of view, which is I'm not going to be perfect. I'm learning and I'm going to have fun along the way. Otherwise yeah. I would have been too self-critical. Well, I'll just say what's interesting to me about this chip is that if you don't go through those first two parts in a thoughtful and serious way, it's very hard to get to the third and have a growth mindset. And I've been struck, as I mentioned to you in our preparatory meeting, we were talking about LSI. We've had over 300 candidates for the next cohort. I'm in a lot of the interviews and we have incredible people, uh, but many haven't necessarily yet um, had that ritual to really let go of the title that they had. And so when you ask questions about, you know, what do you want to do in the future? It'll be, well, I was CEO of this. And so I want to, you know, run now a, a nonprofit that can benefit from all of my expertise. And all of that, by the way, is true. The person might have immense expertise and accomplishment and be an incredible leader, but they're now going to maybe enter a new world and they're going to have to be open to a new set of knowledge. And if they carry too much of that with them, that great strength is going to become a weakness. And I think where it comes from is that there's still a sense of, I want to hold on to this. And if you want to hold on to this, it's very hard to have that growth mindset. So just for me, what's really interesting is the connective tissue between those stages, that if you don't go through the caterpillar and the chrysalis stage, it's very hard to be the butterfly and to be ready for that growth mindset. And so I just I, I find it really interesting how there's an interplay between them in many ways. And you can't skip to step three uh, if you haven't gone through steps one and two, because part of that growth is allowing yourself to release some of the the, the baggage, so to speak, even that builds up with the great strength of the experiences that you've had. And it sounds like you were able to do that. And, and I'll just share one other yeah. analogy that I love from a professor at Booth who teaches, um, it's called traveling lightly. And he describes it as, you know, if you bring all of your life experiences with you on a trip when you're going to travel, you know, that's gonna be a lot. So you only wanna pack the things that are actually useful to where you're going. And by comparison, if I showed up with no luggage and I was going away for a year, that wouldn't be very useful either because I'd be leaving. So you have to be really careful. What are the things 
that really matter and that I can take, but how do I leave behind all the baggage so I'm not weighed down? Let me let you, who is our actual speaker, talk instead of my uh, pontificating on your insights. No, I love it. I, we, you know, I, just listen, our points of view are so simpatico. We call it the great midlife edit. And we think yeah. it's one of the key, key things about midlife is the first half of your life is about accumulating and the second half of your life is about editing. And it's using discernment and wisdom around midlife to understand what really matters and how you're going to invest in that moving forward. And it's a really important piece of it. You're uh, you're absolutely right that if you're carrying all your baggage on the midlife marathon, you're going to get tired pretty quickly. Um, so an essential piece of that is shifting your mindset, shifting identities, knowing what you're supposed to let go of. Um, yeah. And that's one of the things we really help people with as well. I, I also think there's a, a term that I like to use based upon my Airbnb experience, and I call it same seed, different soil. Hmm. So for me, I had a seed and the seed, I wouldn't, I didn't think of it that way. I now know I had right. a seed. You're this a creative. Wind. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I, 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 I picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was wisdom, creativity, entrepreneurship, leadership, yeah. et cetera. That's the seed I had that I could bring with me to Airbnb. Yeah. The key is to know that you want to plant yourself in new soil and new soil uh, elsewhere may mean that you're going to have to get used to new conditions. Um, yeah. And there's a term, a term in environment in um, occupational research um, that's called environmental mastery. And it's something we get better at as we get older and it's understanding what environments we flourish in. And it's not just yeah. professionally, but also personally. And so, you know, it, Knowing that same seed, different soil means you can plant yourself elsewhere. For me, in a tech company, um, means that uh, you just need to know pretty quickly whether you're going to flourish there. And thank God, I felt really good about Airbnb as an environment for a lot of reasons that would work for me. Um, but it, if I'd been at Uber, for example, I wouldn't have lasted because it was a totally different culture. And frankly, my hospitality travel background wouldn't have mattered much at, at Uber. So, um, yeah. So there's a lot more to this, but um, yeah, I, I write a lot about this topic in Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. Um, I write a little bit about it in the new book, Learning to Love Midlife. Well, so coming back to your new book, um, talk about what you want people to take away from it. You know, uh, what do you hope readers gain uh, after reading this book? I mean, I think first I want people to have longevity literacy. I want, I want people yeah. to recognize that if you're 54 and you're going to live till 90, you have half of your adulthood still ahead of you um, because 18 to 54 is 36 years and 54 to 90 is 36 years. And once you have that in your mind, you can start asking the question, 10 years from now, what will I regret if I don't learn it or do it now? Which, you know, I, the idea of um, anticipated regret is almost a form of wisdom. Um, yeah. And it helps to catalyze you into taking action. Um, so, so that's another thing. Helping people to learn how to become a beginner again in, in midlife is important. Um, being clear on purpose and recognizing that there's the big P, big P purpose of things that would go on your resume. And then there's the small P purpose, as David Brooks talks about resume and eulogy, the things that are the smaller things in life that people remember you for. And knowing that there are four steps to helping to find your purpose. And it's something that excites you or uh, uh, something that agitates you, something that makes you curious, or maybe something from earlier in your life that feels like it was forgotten, but you were very passionate about it earlier in your life. Uh, we recently had a, a woman who was a litigation attorney come to MEA and um, she was 60 years old and she was at a stage in her life where she didn't want to be a litigation attorney anymore. She didn't like what it had done to her in terms of creating armor in her life, but she had no idea what she was going to do next. And she didn't, she wasn't ready to quit her job. Um, and so she came thinking she was going to find an adjacent career, like a litigation consultant. Um, <laughs> but that fourth question about like what something from childhood or early adulthood that you loved, but you've forgotten over the course of the first couple of days, she had started having dreams about her grandmother and being in the kitchen at her grandmother's home, baking pies. And then mm. she realized, wow, I, whenever I travel, the first thing I put into a digital map is I want to see the nearby bakeries. 
because I like to just yeah. go there and smell them. And I like to see what they're cooking. And then she also realized when I have dinner parties, what I really want people to do is stay, to stay for dessert. And by the end of the, the week, she realized, I want to go and train to be a pastry chef. I'll do it part time. I'll keep my litigation job, attorney job, but I'm going to see if I like it. And she did three months later. And then she decided to wind down her practice and she's creating a bakery in her neighborhood where uh, uh, the only bakery that was there before closed down during COVID. So helping people to see that purpose is important, community is important, wellness is important. These are, to me, some of the building blocks to create a, a very um, a, a happier, longer life. And we also work with Blue Zones, by the way. Blue Zone, I'm a big fan yeah. of Dan Butner's work and Dan's on our faculty and we do four Blue Zones workshops a year around just, you know, how do we help people understand the habits that actually lead to a longer, healthier, happier life? So I'm going to start some of our questions, which are uh, filling up our chat, Chip. Uh, we have one from Stephen Tang, uh, and he asks, could you please comment on how an intentionally constructed intergenerational work community could help us better develop leadership skills for hybrid and remote work? And I mean, maybe I'll broaden that a little bit beyond just the work context, but how do you think about the power of intergenerationality? We've been talking a lot about midlife, but you have this experience at Airbnb and you are describing the interplay a lot between crystallized and fluid intelligence. So I'm just curious if you could say more about intergenerationality, its value, and maybe even how we seek it out. You sought it out very successfully, but in some ways it's not easy today because there are a lot of stratifications and the polarization in society has in many ways pushed generations apart because they do see different lenses based on a lot of data, more so even than we may have seen, you know, in past generations. And obviously with the dynamism that's happened with technology and other things, there's a lot of reasons why that might be. So apologies for asking three questions at once, but you can, as the guest here, you can pick which one you want to answer at the least. Well, so let's start with the fact that a young brain, as I said earlier, is tends to be very focused and an older brain tends to be holistic in its thinking. Um, there's so much research evidence now that shows there's huge value uh, in age diversity on teams because the yeah. combination of focused and, and holistic together can come to better conclusions. Um, and yet only about 8% of Fortune 1000 companies have are using age as a metric for their DEI uh, uh, evaluation. So, so let's mm. recognize we're pretty early on in this process of understanding the value of intergenerational teams. Um, secondly, 75% uh, of millennials say that they would like to have a mentor, but only 1% say they have a formal mentor. So there's a big gap between um, what people want, younger people want, and what they're actually getting. So there's an opportunity there. Um, and then finally, Deloitte has shown uh, in their research, that when a millennial actually has an, a mentor within a company, um, they're more than twice as likely to last five years in that company. Um, so it's not just a knowledge transfer opportunity, it's also a retention tool. So having said all of that, what I will say is that um, the beauty of intergenerational collaboration is it helps uh, to help everybody feel like it's like an intergenerational potluck you bring to the table that which you know or do best. And if, if it's hard to do this sometimes because there can be a lot of intergenerational stereotypes. You can think, oh, the older people don't care about technology. The younger people are gonna last only two years on the job. They, they, want way too, they wanna grow way too quickly, et cetera. But the fact is, if we can sort of get to a place where we respect and are gonna learn from each other, and that's yeah. really what I did. I had I had over a hundred mentees at Airbnb over the course of seven and a half wow. years, and and I loved that because I learned as much from them as they did from me. So yeah. um, we all just need to be mentors, mentors and interns at the same time. Well, so more questions from the chat. Uh, we have another question uh, that's here that is from uh, Pat O'Brien. Uh, and Pat asks, hold on, uh, should we spend a lot of time and energy to find the possible next chapter, or should we do lots of internships, trying a lot of things and failing more? And so maybe you can talk a little bit about 
you know, the methodology that you recommend. And my guess is, I don't want to speak for you, that it may be that there are different formats for different people and that for some iteration and trying things out and failing and for others, you know, deep discernment and planning. But let me let you uh, take a shot at that. Yeah, I think just as that litigation attorney came up with something that she never would have guessed she'd be coming up with, I think sometimes you have to create the space for something to emerge. And so if you're too um, cerebral about this and too process oriented, you may, I mean, she would never have found this, you know, based upon the tools we gave her uh, way beyond what I've said here on this, uh, on this uh, talk today, we were able to help her unlock something that was way deep inside of her. So I think, first of all, you have to create the space for this to happen. And you could have an existing career to do that. Um, the idea of portfo a portfolio career where you have multiple things that you're doing, each of which is satisfying you in certain ways, some of them financially, other in other cases, more in terms of giving back in certain ways. Um, I think that that's for, for many people what they want later in life. They don't want to have all of their eggs in one basket. Um, but I think the the that what's the best thing to do is to be in a program like LSI or MEA <laughs> to be taken through a roadmap. You know, let me just say one thing and I, I'll get on my high horse on this one. We have done a, while well, adolescents right now are really struggling in, in uh, global culture and especially in US culture, no doubt about that. But the truth is that you go through a lot of transitions in, in your teen years and you have a social infrastructure supporting you and you go through these firsts, first kiss, first part-time job, et cetera, with your friends. And you do it very publicly and um, with that social infrastructure. When we go through middle essence, which is midlife in academic terms, we are going through all kinds of hormonal, emotional, physical, and identity transitions like adolescence. And yet we have no social infrastructure, no roadmap, um, no schools or tools to help people understand what they're going through and very little in the way of a, a cohort who you could be experiencing this with. This is why I think LSI uh, and MEA and uh, programs like ours are really important because having a roadmap and then having a collection of people who are supporting you on your journey and you're reciprocating for them, that is our future. Um, so I would just yeah. you know highly recommend that. When just to put it into those conceptual terms, Chip, the way we often describe the experience over the year here is it's structured iteration that you start by expanding horizons, by trying out things, by diverging. And then with the contemplation that's happening in parallel around, you know, what are my values and what has been my experience to date and where I thrive, you begin to figure out in that Venn diagram of what you're seeing and experience and what you've learned from your history as potential sweet spots. And then, you know, the end of the year is convergence toward, you know, one or a few ideas in the portfolio. So I think very similar to what you're seeing in your methodology, even if over different timeframes. Um, Joanne Pasternak has a really fascinating comment and question. Uh, she works with professional athletes as they transition from their sports career to whatever comes next for them professionally, often long before they are emotionally ready to do so. How can we best support individuals in careers where they become less treasured with age and experience versus more valued? This also involves a total recalibration and reapplication of their skills and interests. And I'll just add that one thing it raises, which I always think about, is that this really can be a set of navigation skills that you may need at different ages and stages based on what type of work you may be involved in. You could be entering a new stage of life at 25 if you're an Olympic athlete and your Olympic days are done. And if you're a military veteran coming home after incredible service, you know, over any time frame. And so there are these examples where people are entering this moment of, I mean, very deep and meaningful inflection at numerous points in the curve. And I imagine there are unique aspects of that for them because of their experience, but then there are many commonalities to what you're describing for sometimes people in their 50s who are reaching the end of a longstanding career. But let me turn that over with that context. Yeah, I mean, you know, Tom Brady was a modern elder in the NFL. Let's be honest. They, right. To be an elder, you know, is a um, a relative term. 
elderly is a whole different thing, but elder <laughs> just means you're often older than the people around you. And so as a software engineer in at 35 in Silicon Valley, you might be an elder. Um, Joanne, it's great to hear from you here. And um, I know we, we've been talking with you. Um, so I would say that, you know, for the last two weeks in a row, this week at MEA in Baja and last week when I was teaching there last week, we've had two basketball presidents and general managers of NFL franchises, both of whom are, are, are uh, one's retired now, the other one just left his job in the last year. And so I, I very much understand what they are dealing with when they have athletes who have basically spent almost all, well, definitely all of their adult life and much of their childhood life of having a certain identity. And like what happens when that identity goes away? So I think the, the key thing here is how do you create cohorts of yeah. people who actually have that specialty? Um, so for example, for software engineers, we've had a cohort of Silicon Valley software engineers um, in their 40s and 50s who needed to figure out what was next for them. And in some cases, it was an adjacency, meaning yeah. what, what it meant like learning how to be a great manager of people. Um, because generally the most brilliant software engineers in their mid twenties are not great managers of people. So at 45, you might be a great manager of software engineers. That's an adjacency. On the other hand, I, I know someone, uh, you know, I've written about a guy named uh, Luther Kitahata and who went from being, um, he did that as the next step. And then he actually became a coach um, and coaching is a, qual is a, is a career path. That's particularly helpful for crystallized intelligence and, people as they get older, because he was able to help younger people do their jobs better. So it's taking managerial skills and two steps further. Um, so yes, I think bringing together people in a cohort who have the common ailment of, we have just left our careers or are leaving our careers at a young age and have no idea what's next, means that they can learn from each other. Millie Ray has a really interesting question because we've talked a lot so far, Chip, about the internal, right? About how individuals reflect, how we discern, how we figure out what's next. But there's a world in which we're doing it. And often that world is very ageist and uh, very focused on a stereotype of who people are. And that can grow even more definitive uh, as you move further into midlife. And so uh, she writes, the struggle I have experienced involve how others see you. So you may have an idea of who you are and what you do, but you also have a title that communicates a kind of identity you have, and it isn't how you see yourself. It's not accurate and it's limited. How do you shift how others see you? How do you overcome the limitations? And I imagine this is especially meaningful in midlife because if you saw someone with a title and they were 25, and they had a certain role, you'd say, oh yeah, but that person's young, they could be anything, right? And you have that idea of, you know, if they're talented, here are all the different possibilities you can imagine for their future. It's a very open-eyed uh, approach. Then you see someone who may be in their 50s. The same is true, to be clear. They could be anything, they could go anywhere, but I don't think that's how our minds interpret it. Um, and if we look at a lot of, you know, psychological data, we would probably be able to, to prove that uh, hypothesis. And so I'm curious, how do you shift others' perceptions? Because that is probably a big part of what you may need to do in order to achieve or where you want to head in midlife. Um, so so uh, when my book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, was coming out talking about my Airbnb experience, one of the best known executive recruiters in the world reached out to me uh, and said, Chip, here's the advice you need to give people um, in midlife about uh, trying to get a job or you know, if they've lost a job or if they're starting starting over again, who, who knows what they're doing, but they, if they're looking for a job, she said, show up in a job interview, assuming you can get that job interview, and we'll come back to that in a second. Show up in your job interview with curiosity and a passionate engagement for what you do and what you're curious about. Um, and if you do that, people won't notice your wrinkles. They'll notice your energy. Yeah. And so I think what I would just say, starting point is, it does start with ourselves. We have to show up with that kind of passionate, curious engagement and be open to expressing the things that are going to be myth busters. A myth buster yeah. would be you talking about your, 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 what you've learned about artificial intelligence in the last year, um, or 
um, just how much in your 50s, you have a lot more space in your life than when you were in your 30s and your 40s because you're an empty nester now. Saying things that help people or even saying, hey, I'm willing to work 80% time for 80% pay because one of the myths around older people often is they're going to be more expensive and they don't have to be because you might want to actually not work full time. And so you could be paid 20% less than a full time job and save the company some money and give yourself some time. So I would just say those are some things to have in your toolbox, but then also take a look at the companies in terms of what their evidence is that they actually appreciate older workers. Um, yeah. You know, in, in for, I mean, and, and frankly, I'd say the opposite for a younger worker, if they're trying to go into a traditional old school manufacturing company or um, another kind of company that is more traditional. So start with, you know, is, is it a ripe habitat for your, for what you have to offer and then get really clear about what you've learned along the way. I mean, I think, you know, the resume is one thing, but what you've learned along the way is your wisdom. It is that pattern recognition you have from your past experience. And being able to be articulate about that and how that's valuable to a new company is helpful. I also will quote Sheryl Sandberg, um, who said in, in, in one of her books, you know, the most important thing you should show up with in an interview uh, is uh, the question of what's your biggest problem as a company? Um, and don't then say, and how can I solve it for you? Because that sounds very egotistical, but start with what's your biggest problem that you're, you're working on right now? And then look at that to weave in what you can do to solve it. And finally, use that soft networking group of people in, in your life. Um, it may not be the person you know, but it's the person who knows that other person who may get you a foot in the door. So Chip, we've talked a lot about midlife, and as we think anew about midlife, it obviously also then changes the way we may think about later life and retirement or whatever name we give to it. We have two questions in the chat. I'm going to read both because I think they're tied and then um, give you the uh, challenge of answering together. So Ira Pilchin writes, one thing I struggle with as I turn 60 is the pervasive model of retirement that to me seems focused on consumption whether it's sightseeing, travel, meeting friends for dinner, reading and watching movies, and even taking classes that might give one the sense that they're growing, but I see as so much entertainment. Do you also observe this view of retirement as pervasive and how do we overcome it? The second question, Christine Cordero writes, do you think there is yet another chapter beyond midlife where you need to create another meaningful transition? And I put those together because what in your imagination does it look like beyond midlife and how do you yeah. think about that differently than maybe this classic view that is still pervasive of retirement yeah. as consumption? Studs Terkel is from Chicago, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know yeah. if that's true, but famous the work theorist. And he, he pretty much said that like part of the reason that we people in the mid 20th century were aspiring to retirement was because they were doing backbreaking, mind numbing work. And by the time you got to 60, you can't do it or don't want to do it anymore. But we now live in a knowledge economy. And so the people who are who are retiring um, are people who still have a brain that works and they don't necessarily want to stop using it. And they see they have value still. And by choice or necessity, they want to work into their 60s, 70s or maybe beyond. So um, the idea of reframing retirement, we have a, an MEA has a course on this, reframing retirement um, that you'll find online, but we also do it uh, in workshops, um, is very uh, topical because so many people see retirement as a, as a dirty word now. <laughs> um, I don't want to do that. And, uh, you know, that's what they're saying. And they also realize, and they've seen the research that says that when people um, retire, they accelerate their mortality by two years. And it's often because they feel less purpose, they feel less of a sense of community, and their wellness falls apart, which is sort of strange if you have more time on your hands, but the average retiree in the U.S. watches 47 hours a week of TV. So wow. long story short is, how do we reframe retirement in such a way that you see it as having more options to you as opposed to less? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's a huge part of our program that's, you know, I would say one of the top five reasons that someone actually comes to MEA is to explore that in a week-long program or in one of our online courses. 
But I think the biggest thing to, I would say is going back to the purpose question. What excites you? What agitates you? What are you curious about? And what's something from earlier in your life that you've forgotten or neglected? Because frankly, those will help you have the right trajectory. Um, and the, the trajectory on this is important because otherwise you're sort of like going off, you're doing this David Brooks thing of the first mountain still, which is success yeah. as opposed to the second mountain being purpose. Well, so I'm going to end with this question from Melissa Wilson, because I think it's a perfect way to kind of conclude our discussion. What is one thing that surprised you about midlife and why? I, I think the biggest surprise I have, and I try to get this across in, in Learning to Love Midlife, the book and at MEA, is that maybe my best years are ahead of me, not just in terms of my career, but also my happiness. And the Ukraine yeah. happiness shows that. Um, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate that midlife has the has the worst brand of any life stage because that we have the word crisis attached to it. But I think the fact that it's a chrysalis, the, the yeah. fact that midlife is this crossroads between early or your early life, uh, adult life and your later adult life allows you to start to curate your life in a way that suits you and learn you learn to say what isn't important is not important to you and that what what really does matter to you so i you know i think it's a great period of life and i you know there, i think there's three stages of midlife and i'll be finished finished with this there's 35 to 50 which is early midlife and that's a tough time in midlife there's 50 to 60 which is the core of midlife and that's when you start to feel the freedom and the optionality and then there's 60 to 75, which is later midlife. And that's when you're really making your own choices about how do you want to live um, those potentially later career years? And then how do you curate the later part of your life as well? And, and so if you can sort of see it as three stages, and the book really goes into some depth on that, um, it, I think it helps a lot as well. Well, Chip, this has been a fascinating conversation. You are indeed a midlife whisperer. And I'll just share, in closing, I shared this with you, uh, that I am in midlife. And, uh, you know, we've worked together, uh, but I have not, I guess, named you by your actual name uh, to my partner. And what's fun is that when your book came out, uh, there was a great New York Times story about it. And it was sent to me, not for my work life, but sent to me personally uh, from my partner, no less, uh, with your tips on how I might navigate. Uh, so you are someone who is making waves just across the world. Uh, you are helping many of us to navigate this moment in our lives that can be extremely enriching and fulfilling in the best ways. Thank you for being our partner in the Leadership and Society Initiative. And uh, most of all, uh, great admiration for what you're building with Modern Elder Academy. Uh, thanks so much for your oh. time this morning. Thank you, Seth. Yeah, it's honored to be here. I don't, I, for six years, I've been doing this. I don't pay myself a thing. I'm lucky to mm -hmm. be at this stage in my life to be able to do that. And I, I do it partly because I lost five friends to suicide in midlife. And I, yeah. I really want to be helpful and give back. So uh, check out my blog. I have a daily blog on the MEA website, meawisdom.com, if, if this is interesting to you. And we will send a follow-up email with the recording, but we will also include the blog and other information for people that want to continue their learning journeys. Uh, thank you, Chip. Wonderful talking to you. Thanks. And Thanks thank so you much. all for joining us. Bye.